screen. Go back here. Hope everybody's doing okay. Let me talk to chat, make sure our chat's working okay here. Sorry, I'm a few minutes late here. So, it's our last content week together, right? I'm sure that everyone's crying, upset. Oh, hold on, hold on. It would help if I did this. Maybe that sounds a bit better. Let me check my levels real quick, make sure I'm good. Yeah, I seem to be good now. I have my mic pointed in the opposite direction. That's not smart to do. All right. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so our last content week together, I see that we have, well, we have five. We have around five people watching. Um, this week, uh, I want to kind of talk about what you got, what you have coming up, and I want to mention a few things about uh, how you're going to prepare for next week because that's going to be really, really important for you. So again, last week of content, if you look into our course, uh, you'll see that I have uh, added. This week's module, so I'm going to move to this section, doesn't really matter. Any one of my intro classes will work. Up here, um, you'll see I got the April 27th through May 3rd uh, module up. Got you guys a little announcement here. Uh, so this is the last week you'll have a reading quiz. This is the last week you'll have a discussion board. This is the last week you will have any PowerPoint. This is the last week you'll have any videos to watch. Um, this is the last week of content per se next week. Uh, the only thing that you have to do, there's two things. One thing is optional. One thing is mandatory. The one thing you have to do is take the final exam, which, which will open next week. The other thing that's optional that you do is there will be a discussion board, a bonus points discussion board, uh, for like r evaluating the class, like what you liked about our time together, what you disliked about our time together, things like that. So, um, those two things will be next week. This week's like a regular week. The only exception being tomorrow. Now tomorrow on Tuesdays, normally I hold office hours, right? And like if you were there last week, I just sat there and answered questions for the entire hour. Had several come in, which was cool. I was able to talk to you guys about stuff. Uh, next week, that will not be the case. Sorry. This week, that will not be the case. Be my brain straight. Tomorrow, the office hours will be replaced by a Kahoot final exam review session. Um, it'll be just like the previous two that we've done right here. So uh, I hope you'll be there at 11 a.m. tomorrow. They will greatly benefit you and prepare you for the exam. Speaking of the preparedness for the exam, I don't want you guys to make the mistake of thinking this exam will be as easy as the last exam. Um, I made a mistake last exam in that I didn't set a strict time limit and that was on me. Some of you took full advantage of that. And, um, let me just say, you won't be able to do that this time. <laughs> uh, this exam will be more difficult. Uh, I would even use the word significantly more difficult. So I, uh, I would expect that you would prepare accordingly. It's only going to be over three chapters, the health, uh, psychology chapter, the disorders chapter, and the therapy. Yeah, JL, the exam won't be easy. No, it won't be easy. I mean, it'll be more, okay, uh, not to like, I don't want to put the fear of God into people watching this. It will be more akin to exam one that you took with me. It'll be more like that, right? So on that difficulty level. Think back to that experience and prepare for that. So I would I would want you to come to, uh, if you could, come to the Kahoot session tomorrow. There's the final uh, review document that's out there. Again, not trying to scare you, just trying to adequately prepare you because I don't want some of you. The last exam, was it was just too easy. Like I'll be honest. I looked at the grade distribution. It was too easy. And you know it. I know it. I didn't want you to kind of lull yourself into the same preparation for this exam and then be horribly disappointed at your performance. That's why I'm making the statement. All right. So as I talk, any thoughts or questions, please, please throw them up in the chat box here as we talk going forward. 
Let's talk about grades for a second. So uh, I did catch up on discussion board grades over the weekend. Um, of course, I still need to grade the one that you posted uh, last night. I'll do that this week. And then you have one more that's due at the end of this week, and I'll grade it. Uh, we are officially one week away from final exams. Grades have been transparent to everyone the entire semester. Right, guys? Like, no surprises here. Your grade book in eLearn has been there the entire term. The only thing that changed in the grade book was I kind of broke up the participation points because we shifted online. Um, one of the one of the things that caused a bit of confusion last week was that I had a grade item that I had created when we first went online over sexuality that we never used um, because we ran out of time. But I just converted that grade item to therapies. If you look at it today, it says DB therapies, discussion board grade for therapies. That was originally going to be for sexuality, but it just didn't pan out that we could use it. So I had to convert it. Um, but but back to grades for a second. But let, me, let, me, let me kind of answer any emails that you may be thinking about sending. No, you cannot submit late work. Um, that's in the syllabus. We talked about it. I don't really feel like that's... But that I really need to explain that that much further. Uh, your grades have been there the whole term. Uh, they're fair. You've been objectively evaluated. It is what it is. So uh, please don't send me an email saying, hey, I made a bad grade on this quiz. Can I retake it? Hey, I missed this quiz. Can I retake it? Hey, I missed this discussion board. Can I redo it? The answer is, I mean, to save you the email, the answer is going to be no. Um, you have plenty of opportunity to get those in on time. If it is something that is extraordinary, um, the circumstances surrounding it were extraordinary, I may be willing to hear those, but uh, it'd have to be pretty extraordinary for me, for me to acquiesce. So, uh, yeah, hopefully that answers any of those questions. I think that wraps up all the administrative stuff I got going on this week. So... If we're good, um, if, if we're good, we're going to go ahead and move in and start talking about therapies for this, this, this bit of content for this week. So we move down to our course information and content. Let's go over and look at the PowerPoint. Scroll down to our module here. Scroll up. Therapies PowerPoint. I'm going to download this one here. This file. How are you guys holding up? Another week of quarantine. Everything going well? Looks like things are starting to kind of open back up a little bit here. I'm curious, those watching, uh, you guys plan on uh, hitting the restaurants and stuff? Will the Kahoot number be accessible on YouTube? And will it show the questions on our computers or will we need to be watching the live stream? It will show uh, the Kahoot number will be accessible. Um, on YouTube, uh, JL, but uh, the only, I think it might be Caleb Lambert. I don't, I don't know. This is the answer. Uh, uh, the, the only thing is that um, when the Kahoot is over, it's over. Like it, it won't be accessible after the stream. Right. So as long as you're in the stream, I mean, you can watch it. It will be vlogged on YouTube so you can watch it later. But um, it, it won't be accessible through Kahoot after we run it so i hope i answered your question um let me know if i did not but yeah it, you need to be here to take part using the coot app like on your phone or computer you need to be live with me however if you're not here and you miss it you could go to my youtube channel and it will be vlogged and you can just watch it that way you just wouldn't be able to like participate and interact and things like that i think the interaction is really important um and i'm very thankful for the number of students who show up for that because i'm able to kind of assess some points of um misunderstanding or uh lack of clarity and we can take time to kind of remediate we could talk about it you know and if no one shows up and it's just me kind of going through the powerpoint or through the kahoot then i really don't get that opportunity yeah 
cool. Yeah, I would. I, I really appreciate that. I, I, I love it when you guys show up to participate. So thanks for, for coming. All right, cool. Well, let's talk a bit about therapies. All right. This big term here, psychotherapy. This chapter, we're going to talk about a number of types of therapy. However, the one that you're test and the one I want you to emphasize the most on is psychotherapy. There's a section in this chapter that talks about medical therapies like drugs. It talks about surgeries. It talks about um, uh, transcranial uh, mediation, like putting probes in the brain and things like that. But for the most part, the kind of questions I'm going to focus on for your exam would be you understanding psychotherapy. And what I mean by that is talk therapy is what I'm uh, essentially getting at, right? So not the delivery of drugs, not necessarily group therapy, and not necessarily any kind of medical approach, but talk therapy, where you typically have like a one-on-one -on -one session with a psychologist that tries to help you recover or, or mitigate the symptoms of a psychological disorder. So talk therapy is, uh, psychotherapies are largely talk therapies where people kind of work their problems out. Sorry about that. Those notifications from my browser. Um, so those uh, therapies, talk therapies, can kind of, they are divided into two subtypes. There's insight-based and there's action-based. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to play a little bit of a video and we're going to break down kind of the aspects of both insight and action-based therapies. As I look in your chapter content here like your chapter divides up if you look it divides up the very first part of your chapter is all about insight therapies and it kind of breaks down because they're similar you know things like humanistic approaches to therapy um, the stalt approaches to therapy and, and then we kind of shift over into action therapies like cognitive and behavioral therapies. So know that distinction. Know those two categories. Insight is more on helping someone arrive at an internal insight with respect to their problems, whether it be a problem of feeling like anxiety disorders, whether it be a problem of thinking like cognitive disorders, whether it be a problem of behavior. The whole goal is to have them arrive at an internal insight. Action therapies are much more assertive. Like you're going to see this. They're, uh, they're very assertive, not passive. They're very active in the therapy session. They will challenge clients. They will interrupt clients. You'll never see someone in insight therapy typically do that. They're much more passive in the way they deliver the therapy. So psychotherapy is talk therapy. And it's further divided into insight and action approaches. Biomedical therapies will be talked about later in the chapter, but they're a group, you know, devoted to things like medication and, and like I said earlier, like probes and, and surgeries, things like that. Um, psychotherapy, um, in terms of Freud's, you know, Freud's approach kind of have, has its own category, if you will. Uh, Freud's unique like that right <laughs> he's that's like his own his own category when it comes to um, the way he delivers therapies but it technically is an insight approach so the the psychotherapy that freud practices is called psychoanalysis and if you remember right back to when we first started talking about freud as a as a his his ideas as a theory we said they largely res kind of reside in the unconscious mind. And what you're going to see is in these kind of therapies, things like a use of trying to uncover defense mechanisms, kind of recurring, repeating uh, uh, patterns of behavior that show up early in life, usually in childhood. And they kind of what people do is they kind of learn these things early in childhood and they use them as defense mechanisms, sometimes to their detriment throughout the course of their life. And so you're going to see a lot of emphasis on things like uh, shorter treatment times and a more a direct approach. They're still, however, categorized 
as an inside approach. And you'll see that in a second in the therapy I'm, film I'm going to show you. Humanistic approaches are different. They're like more, they're still insight uh, focused, but they're more like what we call client centered therapy. Uh, where, again, if Freud, going back here, Freud was all about the unconscious mind, id, ego, super ego, you know, that pleasure seeking principle of id, that lust seeking principle of id kind of driving you, then the humanistic approach is much more about what? You're born good, not bad, as Freud would argue, and you seek to achieve self-actualization. So if that's true, the, the reason that humanistic is quite different than Freud's view is it's all about like unconditional positive regard. If you're good, I need to, <laughs> sometimes the cigar is just a cigar. Yes, sometimes the cigar is just a cigar. Um, but with humanistic therapy, more so about being authentic to them, unconditional positive regard, lots of reflection. Like they're more passive than than a psychodynamic therapist would be and you'll see that in a second they they do a lot of reflection like a client will say something and they'll just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and can you go into more about the depth of that um can, can you tell me a little bit more about that and unfortunately the cliche statement and and how does that make you feel uh they use those kind of redirections reflections back onto the the client Behavioral therapy is much more, they're definitely not insight therapies. They are, they are clearly action-based approaches, and and they rely on direct uh, behavior modification to try to change usually unwanted behavior, but sometimes unwanted thoughts. Um, they use a variety of different approaches. Sometimes it's exposure therapy, where you introduce a client into controlled situations to to kind of relieve their anxiety or fears so for example you've probably been wondering all semester long like okay terry's this weird guy he does research in virtual environments video games like what does that have to do with what i think about psychology which most people rightly so think about things like disorders They're like what does that have to do with disorders i don't understand how him doing research in video games has anything to do with disorders. Actually, with exposure therapy, my research has direct implication. Because you see, therapy is not going to work well unless when you're exposing someone who has, let's say, let's say they have a phobia of riding a subway and they live in New York, which is sort of a problem, right? So unless that you, when you're exposing them through a virtual environment, to riding a virtual subway car to work unless they believe it's real and unless their body physiologically responds as though it's real the therapy is not going to be as effective so that's where my research kind of feeds in systematic desensitization i'll also use to treat phobias it but a little different it's it's where they're kind of asked to make a list of ordered fears and then they're given breathing treatments often they're giving rapid exposure therapy so i'm going to show you a little bit of that today to kind of lower fears over a period of time aversion therapy is very different it's when you're um it's when your uh, really undesirable behavior is paired with an aversive stimulus to reduce the frequency of the behavior loud noises uh think think negative reinforcement right Think the presentation of something that's very uh, undesirable being paired with an aversive stimulus to reduce the frequency of a behavior. So, uh, sl sort of punishment, sort of negative reinforcement. Think along those lines. Uh, I'm not sure if I have time to show you one of those today, but I'll try. Cognitive therapies. The best, right? <clears throat> Bit of bias showing up. That is where you're challenging catastrophic thinking where we're looking at distortions in the way people think. And to show you a bit of that, let's uh, slide over to my YouTube channel here. I'm gonna show you to start a therapy session here.
This is the one that's linked. I should have just gone to the actual uh, link in the... Let me do that to test the link. Here's the video for therapy. Let me launch it, see if it launches properly. Should have just done that right from the beginning. Yeah. All right, so I'm not going to show you this whole video. I want you to watch the whole video, though, on your own, but I want to kind of snapshot some parts of it that are important. Uh, this particular woman is suffering from depression. She's been um, dealing with depression because her husband left her after so many years of marriage. And she's going to first see a humanistic therapist. Uh, this therapist practices based on insight approaches, right? And in particular, he's going to use a lot of reflection. He's going to be asking her questions about the depth of her emotion. So I'm going to pause it at times. We're going to stop it and we're going to look at it and talk about it. So here we go. Let me turn the volume up so you can hear. Who chose to use a humanistic model? The goal in humanistic therapy is for the therapist to create a relationship with the client so that the change agent becomes the relationship rather than any other technique. In doing so, what I'm doing is a lot of reflecting. For instance, I'm reflecting emotion. You're feeling upset. You're feeling angry. You're feeling sad or hurt as a way to help the client to experience my understanding of their process. And that's how the humanistic model works, is as the client experiences me understanding the client, then the client gains understanding for him or herself. Linda, we've been talking for a while, and I wonder right now, where would you like to go in terms of utilizing the time that we have together? Um, you know, what's really bothering me is um, not being able to let go of my uh, former husband. And he's definitely moved on. He's remarried. And it's really hard for me to let go of that. So part of it for you, then, is to be able to let go of the marriage in order to free yourself to be available to move on to a new relationship. Right. I know there's a lot I haven't completely healed from. Mm -hmm. Okay. And tell me about the part that you haven't healed from. I mean, you're having a really hard time dealing with the fact that he's remarried uh -huh. and that he's not with me, uh -huh. at least with somebody new. Uh -huh. um, and I don't even know how to how to put that into words, but I need to release about that. Uh-huh. Other than um, I th thought that we would be married for the rest of our lives. So you thought you'd be married for the rest of your life and married to your soulmate. Mm -hmm. And now he's married to someone else. Right. And when you think about that, how do you feel? Oh, I was saying I'm tearing up, so it makes me feel sad. And not just sad, but like really sad. Mm-hmm. Okay, so a couple of things. When you hear a humanistic therapist delivering therapy. So this woman is suffering from depression. She's seeking the aid of a therapist in psychotherapy. A couple of the words that come to mind as you watch Stephen talk. Authenticity, right? He is open, honest, and non-judgmental at all times. Um, very passive, very open, very honest. Unconditional positive regard, right? Supportive, kind of the empathetic, caring perspective you see in a therapist just that complete unconditional positive regard and again the empathy response um he says to her how does that make you feel and she said well i feel really sad I i'm tearing up and he says like you know really sad like you've at one point he says like you've lost a soulmate i think he says to her and he's empathizing with her he's empathizing with her that uh, Yes, yeah, perfect, Jail. Uh, exactly. Kind of, yes, very sad. They show, hey, I'm empathizing with you. I have unconditional positive regard. Now, I want to pause and ask you guys a question as you think about as you're watching this. And this is a good moment to think about. M most people say, Terry, why do we have all these different approaches to therapy? Why, I don't understand. Why do we have to learn about all these different approaches? Why can't we just have one approach? Because not all approaches fit all disorders. A question for you guys right here, right now. How well do you think this therapist, Stephen, great guy, right, would do with the disorders that I showed you last week? How well will he do with the schizophrenic patient, Etta? Answer for me. I'm going to repeat some of Etta's um, dialogue, and I want you to think about how well it would work with Stephen. 
the one and the two and the three of the clock is after the five of the clock and the three of the clock means you go to the store but you don't answer the phone because the phone's ringing and Jesus makes the shotgun sound you remember some of that rhetoric from the video last week that I put on there for you guys the utter disorganization of thought in from Etta the woman suffering from schizophrenia how well do you think that this particular approach would work? If you had unconditional positive regard, empathy, authenticity, the therapy session would go all over the place. It would be incoherent. It wouldn't be effective. And so uh, you need to think about fits as you watch these not all therapies fit all disorders. And I want to make one more uh, statement. Not all therapy approaches fit all people's personality. Some of you watching this therapy session right now are watching Stephen, and no doubt in your mind, here's what you're thinking. Uh-uh. I need someone to tell me what's going on, what's going wrong. Stop being so passive. Stop being so empathetic butt in and tell me what's wrong this is a waste of my time however some of you in that alternative setting when someone was assertive would get up and leave the therapy session you just want someone to listen to you specifically a parent of schizophrenic may seem skeptical and the counselor's unconditional part of regard and the client may even think he's on a conspiracy <laughs> yeah right jail right i mean it could go Every which way from Sunday, basically, uh, because of their bizarre delusions and hallucinations. Can you see where this kind of authentic, unconditional, positive regard, empathetic approach would, would not, it would just not be an efficient use of therapy time in that setting. Uh, largely, right, that's what, why people with schizophrenia are largely tr treated with biomedical approaches, drugs. Uh, some therapy sessions as well, but largely drug drug therapies and what you use there a bit more and then we'll kind of contrast look at a different approach and you feel really sad because you had hoped and you expected that the two of you would be together forever and that with the end now he's with someone else right um we, i always thought whatever happened we could work it out right that but it takes two people to work on it mm -hmm. yeah and that didn't happen mm -hmm. We worked together for many years, and when we um, he started pursuing your career in music, um, we didn't work together anymore. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that we grew apart, mm -hmm. and that was part of the problem, mm -hmm. um, if not all of it, really. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't expecting that. Mm -hmm. um, I never thought I'd be living here. Um, it's just been a lot of changes in the past um, oh, seven or eight years. So it's been a lot of changes in the past seven or eight years, and part of it you didn't expect, like right. for him to go off kind of in a do his own thing, which mm -hmm. sounds like over time caused the two of you to drift a little bit. Right. Oh, yes, because I was working 10 hour days, and, mm -hmm. and he was trying to pursue a career in music. I'm kind of going to stop there and just say, you know, he's just reframing doing a lot of reframing of what she's saying, that reflection back onto her. So I think you guys get the gist of like the humanistic therapist. And I want to show you something. Some of you have the ebook, some of you have the regular book, but I want to show you a particular concept map, right? That I think would benefit you. For inside approaches, we're talking about Freud's and this one, when we're about to look at Freud's in a second, I would really urge you to look at I'm going to move my mic for a second. Hold on. This. That particular concept map. <laughs> get too close to my camera. Hold on, hold on. Let me get better at this. Terry is sucking at this bad. Hold on. <laughs> wait, wait a second. I'll get it down. All right. Uh, yeah, this map. If you have the textbook, it's on page... 595, page 595. I'm going to type in chat, page 595 is the con is the insight uh, therapy concept map. 
I would um, I would look at that in contrasting these two approaches, that being inside approach of humanistic, inside approach of psychoanalysis, because there are they are similar, they are different. Um, now that you've seen the humanistic, let's shift to Freud. Let's go to the psychoanalysis. So, uh, we talked a little bit about it, but I want to move back here for a second. Uh, go up here, back to... Uh, Terry, no. Yeah, here we go. So, a bit more direct than what you've heard before. And... What you're gonna what you're gonna hear is a lot of evaluation of the childhood and trying to determine unconscious defense mechanisms that are being employed that cause someone to trip up. And I, before I play the therapy session, I'm, I'm gonna give you guys a, a clear example, and I think you'll be able to see it in me. You know, we've been able to develop a relationship over this semester, and, and I, it, it pains me to say I was I felt like I was really getting to know you guys when all this COVID-19 stuff hit. But usually by the by about week eight, nine, like I'm really feeling um, more connected to you. Like I'm getting to know your personality a little bit more, nuances. You know, you're easing up a bit. I'm easing up a bit. And... Uh, we can begin to share a, a, a bit more about it, our backgrounds. So for me, um, a lot of students will say, uh, you know, that they think my personality is that I'm very lax and easygoing. But then they get great and then they're confused. They're like, whoa, Terry, you know, he, he didn't have any, he made no qualms about this failing grade. That's because I didn't give you that grade. You earned it, right? We've already talked about that. But they kind of mistake my a very easygoing personality uh, for being easy on tests or easy on a paper and it doesn't work out for them. But then they'll ask me for things. So, hey, Terry, I'm having trouble here. Can you help me with this? And what you'll begin to notice is that I typically say yes. Typically, not always. Uh, and that's part of my personality. That's a part of the defense mechanism that's a part of me. And Freud's psychoanalysis theory completely explains why that is. Um, when you grow up, with an alcoholic parent, as I did, uh, and you're young, you start to develop defense mechanisms to offset things. So let me explain. My father would come home. Uh, he'd come home with a large amount of alcohol with him. I'd get off the school bus. I'd see it. I'd notice what was happening. I'd notice him start drinking. And I'd begin to plan in my mind at that moment, the moment when my mom walked in the door. My mom got off later than my dad because my mom did not like him drinking at all. And she was very much uh, liked conflict, still does to this day uh, as well. So she would come home and she would just lie to my dad about drinking and then he would get mad at her and then the conflict would ensue and it could get, you know, bad, let's say. Uh, not healthy uh, for, for developing children to be around that at all. And so what I learned early on was that if I could be pleasing, I could diffuse the situation. So I got off the bus. I see my dad had a bunch of beer with him. I'm thinking, oh boy, he's going to start drinking that 12 pack of beer and he's going to get drunk and then my mom's going to get upset. And so she, she'd get home. And what I learned to do is I would go in when the conflict would emerge and I would be pleasing to diffuse the conflict as a defense mechanism for my anxiety of the conflict that was going to ensue. I would walk in to the middle of the emerging argument and I would say something to my dad like this. Hey, dad, my dad loves sports. Hey, hey, guess what? Uh, uh, coach says I'm going to get more playing time in the game this week. Or, hey, I really did well at practice. Uh, hey, I think I'm going to start this week. Hey, I think I'm going to get this, that, whatever. Um, and it would turn his attention. And he would, I would be pleasing to him and he would lower his confrontation my mom very much loved academics so i would turn to her and go hey ace this test in honors hey i did this i did that try to distract her 
And invariably, it would turn into things like, hey, well, Terry, are you going to do this next week? Yeah, I'm going to do this. And but by being pleasing, I would lower the level of conflict. Now, that worked well as an as adolescent, right? 13, 14, 15-year-old kid. Doesn't work well as a 40-something-year-old man. Um, I have a hard time saying no. Terry, will you be on this committee? Terry, will you serve in this function? Will you advise these extra students? Will you be a Tennessee Promise Mentor? Will you, as I got up at 5.30 in the morning this past Friday, which I love doing, to grade science posters and presentations at the Tennessee Statewide Science. Virtual, we had to do it virtually. But I'm up at 5.30, like grading, grading, evaluating all day, trying to give these students their due because they spent all this hard time researching. And I said yes to it. I have a hard time saying no. And what is that, the kind of, psychological pressure that puts on a person is you tend to take on too much stuff and that causes a lot of distress and you learned about that you stress distress distress is that harmful stress right so i have to really work on that today what you're going to see in linda the same woman before is similar to what i just explained you're going to see her learn something early in life that's going to be recovered in the psychoanalysis therapy session so watch it and let's kind of break it down you, and you'll see her kind of use something similar to what I use. Watch. It was Linda's third stop. Psychodynamic therapy differs from humanistic and cognitive behavioral models in its stress upon the role of unconscious motivations and childhood experiences. Psychodynamic therapy is a way of doing therapy that's based on a model that identifies a recurrent pattern in the history of an individual and illuminates it so that somebody can get the idea, that's what we call the insight, that what they're doing is a repetition of something that they learned early on. We all learn early on in life in our early primary relationships how to adapt to another person. And frequently we take those early patterns and use them as models as we go on in life. Sometimes it works well. Sometimes we repeat things that aren't appropriate. It's not that they were never appropriate at one time in life, but they don't lead to what you might want to accomplish at, at a later stage in life. You know, one thing that would help me, Linda, is to understand a little bit about your history. I wonder if you could just tell me something about just your family, where you come from, mm -hmm. just the nature of your life growing up. I'm the oldest of five kids, and I grew up in Kansas. Mm -hmm. um, had really um, wonderful parents and a close family. We're very close knit, still mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. My father's passed on now, but my mother um, and my brothers, I have three brothers and a sister mm -hmm. younger than I am. And I was really the one who was um, helped out a lot, especially when my mother got pregnant. Um, my brother was born when I was 10 and then she got pregnant again right away and so I had another brother that came along when I was 11 and she was very sick the whole pregnancy so I took care of the uh, first one <laughs> John. So in other words you were 10 your I was, mother had, didn't have other children until you were 10? No I have one brother that's two and a half years younger than I am uh -huh. um, but I was the one that was a little mother and always was the helping person, loved to cook and loved dolls. And uh -huh. when my brother John came along then, and my mother was so sick, I took care of John a lot. Uh -huh. um, and we're still very close. We used to have a special bond. Uh -huh. Then my sister came along when I was 16, and I took her every place with me. She was uh -huh. like my little mascot. <laughs> But it sounds like people early on recognize your ability to be a good caretaker. Okay, so let's break this down. Psychoanalysis can involve a lot of different therapy approaches, right? Uh, this particular one is kind of a modern approach where you're looking back at someone's history and you're trying to figure out id, ego, super ego defense mechanisms. <clears throat> there are also dream interpretations, which I'm not a huge fan of, by the way, um, not a huge fan of these, where people go into therapy sessions and uh, a therapist helps them interpret and analyze their dreams and how that's their dreams are contributing to their disorders. Not the best scientific evidence currently about the efficacy of those therapies, but it's an approach. 
Another is what's called free association. So someone will show up in a therapy session unlike this. They'll just talk about anything they want. The therapist will say, what do you want to talk about today? In free association, the therapist, uh, the client will start talking about anything on their mind. You know, kind of go all over the place. But um, that was originally developed by a guy named Brewer. But in any case, uh, this is more of a kind of a, a modern psychodynamic approach that you're seeing. She looks into Linda's past. She asks about her childhood and growing up. And then she says at the end of it, importantly, what notice what she said. It seems like early on people recognized your ability to be a good caretaker. You could almost say the same thing about me. Terry, it seems like early on people recognize your ability to be a pleasing person to be around, to be an accommodating person, to be a helpful person. Remember that. Here we go. Evidently. Once Dr. Brown had explored Linda's childhood, she turned to the subject of Linda's marriage and divorce. In many ways, Linda, it sounds as if the fact that you had those years together and they, from your perspective, were so good, feels like you don't sit here today saying, I made this terrible mistake. Oh, no, I would, I would do the same thing all over again. Uh -huh. I don't think I would change anything. Um, the only thing I've been maybe changed is the last few years, and I would make him go into their therapy with me somehow, <laughs> or go into it myself, and uh -huh. somehow make him deal with, uh, he was going through really bad depression, and, um, I think he, at a certain point, he felt that it was just easier just to not deal with me anymore, uh, or with the situation, he wanted to focus totally on his music, uh -huh. And I'm not sure that I would have been able to change that, but maybe I would have known it was time to let go because it wasn't my dream. He uh -huh. loves the attention, and I'm more a background person and and supportive. And um, I could have done it if he was making a lot of money and I didn't have to work, um, but I couldn't do it when I was working. And I do enjoy my job, so... Uh -huh. um, yeah, I, th I think it was definitely time that it ended, but it was too abrupt for me. So when you think about it now, does it seem as if there was a period of time when he was trying to break away from the relationship and he was more ready to mm -hmm. go than you were, but you just didn't see what was happening at that time? Um, hmm. I don't think even he saw, no. I, I think he just was in his own space. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden, he wasn't, it's like I, he was complaining about things I did he never had done before. Uh -huh. You know, he just wasn't happy. And I knew that, but I didn't know how to fix it. I couldn't fix it. But you're saying he wasn't happy and he was focusing his unhappiness on you mm -hmm. on what you didn't do right. Right. And that's the first time in her marriage that had ever been the case. And that made it very stressful, of course, uh, for me. One thing I am curious about, when you said that he started getting very critical of you, mm -hmm. and your response to that was that you would go to him and ask him what was wrong with him, or, you know, like, why did he feel bad, or, you know, and, and it reminded me again of how you've described yourself as such a good caretaker. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you weren't the one, you weren't the kind of woman that would say, hey, cut this out, this is not okay. <laughs> yeah, that's not me. <laughs> that you wouldn't do that, rather you would just that your way of dealing with your discomfort mm -hmm. is to ask him what was uncomfortable for him. Right. What could I do to make it better? I thought I could make it all better. So, again, there was Linda the caretaker. Mm -hmm. Exactly. My previous patterns came out big time. When someone like Linda um, comes across as having resolution particularly, for example, that she recognized so clearly the notion of her role as caretaker. It was important for me not to intrude and push too far to, in, in, in terms of seeing how, even though she understood it, she, she didn't really see the depth of it. And I don't think she really has yet to see how much that has deprived her in life of being able to, um, to have
have a life that comes more from inside of her rather than is an expression of trying to please and be pleasing to the other person. Okay, let's let's break this down. I'm going to answer JL's question here in a second from chat. But uh, clearly you kind of saw in her life uh, that reoccurring, you know, her husband says to her, I mean, you think about this, right? Just, just if you're married to someone and you've been married for years and years and they're like, hey, you keep working. I want to start a music career. And now a lot of people would say, what? <laughs> say, no, uh, we're in this thing together. We got a mortgage. We got bills like uh, you need to pull your fair share. Most people would stand up and say, this is not what I signed up for. Like for us to be in this relationship together. No. I'm not agreeing to that. Not Linda, not her. What does she, what does she say? Whatever you want, honey. What, whatever makes you happy. Just like when she was younger, she learned that, you know, hey, her mom had a lot of kids and she had to be a mom. And uh, she had to learn just to kind of do whatever her mom asked her to do. And she learned that the defense mechanism for that would be just to be pleasing to other people. And... That be that pattern of behavior has followed her into life, into adulthood, and it's resulted in her being a pleaser in relationships. And I bet you know, e even though a lot of you, all of you watching this actually right now are high school students, uh, I know you've been a lot of you have been involved in deep relationships with people, and probably even though your life is relatively short, let's say compared to mine, you've most likely been in a relationship uh, with a pleasing person. Now, even the best of you, right, the most altruistic of you watching this in my classes, uh, the kindest, most altruistic person, if you're in a relationship with a pleasing person, you do something. You freaking run over them. You run over them. It's, and you don't mean to. But, you know, I'll, I'll give you a good example of this. You start dating someone. And, and, and they ask, hey, where do you want to go out? No, no, you ask them. Hey, where do you want to go to dinner tonight? Let's go out Look, wherever you want to go. Okay. And the first time you hear that, you're like, okay. Um, no, really, what do you really want? And they say, whatever you want, and you pick eventually, right? At some point, you stop asking. At some point, you just don't even ask them anymore. You just choose for the two of you. You kind of obscure their ability. And you run over them. And that's not a healthy relationship to be in. It gets boring for you and the person, the other end of the person gets kind of set aside. Like Linda was set aside. So uh, let me answer a question by JL for a second here. The question was, uh, yes, yeah, she's too agreeable. No doubt about it, JL. Uh, does the, do psychodynamic approaches take a long time? Because it seems like there's a lot of talking, pausing, contemplating, talking, pausing. Yes, uh, talk therapy in general takes time. Uh, like, for example, you rarely will see sessions shorter than half an hour. Most of the time, they'll be at least an hour slot long. But let me rank them for you, JL. You ready? Longest, without question, humanistic. Weeks, months, years, some people stay in therapy in humanistic uh, settings. Second longest, psychodynamic. Um, not as long as humanistic approaches. Still a lot of talk because you got to kind of review their history, their roles. And then shortest would be cognitive and behavioral. And I would say the very shortest would be purely a behavioral approach. And you're going to see some of that in a few minutes. She's too agreeable person. She's agreeable person or non-confrontational. Yes, agreed. She's too agreeable, maternal. Uh, yeah, at all. But again, you know, some there's some debate. And we. I, I'm kind of sad to say we didn't have a, a, a chance to deep dive into personality this semester. But there's still de some debate about something you guys have learned about, which is temperament, right? Temperament says fixed characteristics at birth. Uh, slow to warm up, easygoing, uh, difficult. Remember that? The three temperament types of infant ch children. There's some agreement that those correlate to personality types, right, throughout life. But then there's other uh, theories about personality that 
uh, there are role model there are models around you observational models that you look to to gain personality types uh, characteristics from where you model your behaviors your attitudes your emotions after them and when you think about Linda uh, maybe it could be deemed her personality if it were modeled I would argue from whenever she was younger for sure okay so you see the two inside approaches now we're going to flip over to an action approach to kind of round out our day and as you see me smiling and happy, you're going to know that I have a clear bias here towards action approaches. Uh, so there's an action approach. I thought there was one. Maybe at the end here. Yeah. There's an action approach concept map on page 604. I'm going to try this, but I'm just going to say 604. It looks like this. It's kind of a large map. Uh, Take a look at this action approach. Sorry for my stomach growling. Uh, look at this action approach concept map. And, and we're going to, it breaks it down into two. It says cognitive behavioral, right? But often they're used together. You hear the term, the acronym CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Because of this, guys, before you can have behavioral change for anyone, you got to challenge someone's thinking first. So let's look at Linda and, and look at her in a CBT setting now, which is going to be quite a bit different. Watch. Get it right. Here we go. A few weeks later, Linda visited Christine Podesky, a psychologist who practices both the cognitive and behavioral therapeutic approaches. While the humanistic approach focuses on self-awareness, the cognitive and behavioral approaches focus on changing how a person thinks and behaves. Cognitive means thinking, and in cognitive therapy, we pay a lot of attention to the thoughts, beliefs, and meanings that people have. The reason we do this is because the meanings we have for events in our lives have a strong impact on our emotional reactions, our behaviors, and even the physical responses that we have. Behavior therapists look at behavior and what factors in people's lives either serve to maintain behavior or help make changes in behavior. Oftentimes, therapists who do use cognitive methods also use behavioral methods, so we call them cognitive behavioral therapists. There's two issues that are kind of on your mind today. One issue is that you realize you still have some anger and bitterness towards your ex-husband and toward what happened and ending your relationship with him. And the other thing is that you kind of want to resolve that for yourself so that you can move on in the future. Exactly. I don't think I can be happy unless I get all of that out and really look at it, deal with it, and let it go. So tell me a little bit about this anger and bitterness. Well, I feel like he, he uh, reneged on our deal. That mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, He decided for his own reasons, mostly... I don't know. I, I don't know what his reasons really were. Mm -hmm. um, but for whatever reason, he, he just decided it wasn't worth working on it anymore. Mm -hmm. And that makes, makes me very angry because mm -hmm. I trusted him. Okay. And what does that mean to you if he did renege on the deal? What does that mean? Well, it means can I really trust anybody, what they say. Mm -hmm. People have good, you know, they mean well. Mm -hmm. Everybody, nobody gets married thinking they're going to get divorced. Mm -hmm. But uh, we both had been div divorced before, so I thought he was more serious, um, like I was, about really, truly making it work. So you kind of feel like you thought he knew him pretty well, and if he reneged, then maybe you can't trust exactly. anybody to follow through. Uh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I hadn't thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. But yes, I trusted him more than anybody ever. Mm hmm so it, the stakes are pretty high. You know, it, that's an important person to then betray you in a way mm -hmm. because then you don't know if you can trust anybody. And I think that's part of what happens when we have such a loss because mm -hmm. you and he were together how many years? 17. 17 years that you have such a loss that it it's not just a loss of that person, but it sounds like you lost in some sense your faith in humanity. Yeah. I think that's true. And my faith in myself that maybe I wasn't such a good judge of character. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard to uh, deal with that mm -hmm. feeling like maybe I, I didn't have such great judgment or how could I be so wrong about somebody? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Again, I'm going to ask us to kind of pick a direction here because we've got two themes going. One theme is this theme of um, if he reneged on you, maybe you can't trust mm -hmm. anybody. And the other is this theme of trusting yourself and mm -hmm. your own judgment. And if you think about it, Linda, is one of these themes, do you think, more driving behind the anger and bitterness you've been feeling than the other? Or? So right there is a perfect illustration of what she just said of the assertiveness you will see from a cognitive behavioral, cognitive or behavioral or a cognitive behavioral therapist that you will not see in a humanistic setting and you will not see in a psychodynamic setting, ever. That is, she interjects in the therapy session and she asserts, hey, hold on a second. You're talking about this one theme. You're talking about this other thing. Let's stick to, let's, let's stay on track. Which do we want to focus on right now? You would never hear a humanistic therapist say that. That violates the core principles of that approach. Um, that assertiveness you will only see here in one of these two therapeutic approaches. A bit more. Are they both equally important? No, I think I'm more angry at him. I'm though. not getting a sense, Linda, of what what's making you so angry. Right there, some people will get up and leave. When she's that assertive, she's like, whoa, hold on. It almost like discounts what she's saying to, to keep her on track and push her back. And what a lot of people will say is they'll look at that facial expression, that body language, that assertiveness. And they'll get up and leave the office like it just won't work out for some people a little bit more. I mean, I, I understand there's a sense of betrayal, mm -hmm. but I, I guess I'm not clear what the piece of it is that really makes well, I'm angry. angry with yeah. Good question. Um, I think angry because he didn't keep his word. And he wouldn't even... I was... I, I, I know what it is. Because for the, pat, the two years previous to him leaving, I knew something was wrong and mm -hmm. things were going wrong. Mm -hmm. And he was depressed. Mm -hmm. And I tried to get him, in, get him into therapy with me. Mm -hmm. to work it out because I didn't I could see we weren't getting anywhere mm -hmm. I, I wasn't able to reach him mm -hmm. and he just he didn't want to do that he was for whatever reasons thought I wouldn't help and he, and he never said yes we need this mm -hmm. so he never gave me a chance mm -hmm. that's and what that, it is that gets you emotionally <laughs> that sense that he didn't give you a chance not so much that the relationship ended. Maybe if you'd given it a full chance, yeah. and it ended. That would have meant something different. Exactly. But he didn't even give you that chance. I, he just made a best mind, and that mm -hmm. was it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes me the most angry. Yeah. Because it was a um, unilateral decision at that point. Mm -hmm. It kind of left you out of that. Yeah. But at least if he got into the therapy, I would have felt like. Um, he tried, mm -hmm. and that we put the effort. Yeah, and that's the part that was missing, that sense that he was willing to at least put in the effort with right. you after all that time together. Exactly. Yeah. So that's really fueling your continued kind of anger and bitterness right yeah. now. And I'm, I'm wondering what you think is necessary for you to be able to let go of that. Well, getting in touch with it is the mm -hmm. first step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I really hadn't realized that's what it was mm -hmm. so much. One of the main things I think I did in the session with Linda that was helpful is I tried to help her clarify her meaning systems uh, and what some of the meaning was behind some of the difficulties that she was having. In a future session, I would probably begin to work with Linda more on some of the behavioral changes that she might make in order to achieve the goals that she sets for herself. But until Linda understands more her emotional reactions and the meanings that those have for her, it's a little bit premature at this point to begin to do behavior change. So Even though psych I want to read. Uh, well, hold on. Let's see if we get her here. I want to come down here to cognitive therapies and I want to I want to look at this slide in particular and this is emphasizing your book as well what you heard uh, you know Linda saying in that therapy session did you hear some overgeneralizations uh, 
Did you notice that she was fixated on, like, for example, let's, I want to tackle the selective thinking for a second. She's like, she said, um, if I could have gotten him the therapy, everything would have been fine. Like, the, the fixation is, it's all his problem. That she had no factor. She was not a factor in the reason that the relationship fell apart. Like, if I could just get him to therapy, not me, him. So the, there's that aspect of it. Overgeneralization, I heard several. You guys care to throw some in the chat? Did you hear some overgeneralizations uh, uh, that, that she made? Arbitrary uh, inferences. Drawing conclusions without really any evidence. She made some statements about her husband that I think uh, lacked evidence in terms of uh, why the relationship fell apart. But this therapy is all about logic, thinking, helping distorted cognitions or beliefs, and then helping people sort out the logic of their thinking. Because there's a lot of, think about this, guys. The emotionality robs us many times of how logical our thinking should be. Right? You, you ever been a, uh, the, part, the end of a bad breakup? Your logic is just highly irrational. You want the person back at all costs a lot of times, and you, you'd be willing to be not yourself to to stay in the relationship. You'd be willing to do things you normally wouldn't do to stay in there. It, it, it's just bizarre thinking people will often engage in. But uh, yeah, overgeneralization, I, you know, what she said in that therapy session, since no one's typing, I think is interesting. She's like, if I can't trust him, I can't trust anybody. We can all relate to that. Come out of a bad relationship. You, you have to know. For a while, I'm going to have trust issues, especially if that relationship ended because of a mistrusting act on that, on the part of the person you were in the relationship with. So, you know, there's distorted thinking, and then I think she made a good point. Later on, they'll move to doing things like uh, behavioral change, right? And that is using things like you've already known, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, maybe punishment, hopefully not punishment, as a way to kind of deal with those. Uh, this is a very nice table. I'm just going to say that one more time. This is a very nice table. Man, I like this table. You guys like this table? I love this table. Like, if I were making a test one day, I think I would really, I think I would spend some time on this table when I make questions. All right. We're we're past twelve o'clock, um, so that's all for today. Uh, thoughts, comments, concerns about the three major approaches to uh, therapy. What do you guys think? The, hold on, JL. Did I answer your? Well, hold on. I want to ask JL this question, and then I'll give. I want to kind of throw it back at him, and I'll throw it everybody in chat. What do you guys think? Like with Linda in particular, did you find one of the three approaches to be more revealing? more effective than the others with her particularly because and i don't want to ask you the follow-up question that there's a discussion board this week that asks you hey for you in particular with your personality in the future if you were suffering from a disorder which of the three approaches do you think you would use and why so as you answer the question about linda i would ask you to think about yourself because guys the thing is when it comes to disorders, it's not really a matter if you will develop a disorder, but when. All of you will certainly go through de depressive episode at minimum throughout your life. You just will. Um, you'll lose someone close to you. For some of you, that's happened already. For others of you, it's about to happen. By the time you approach the end of adolescence, what usually happens is in early adulthood is you start to lose your grandparents. And so for the first time in your life, you will suffer real loss. You will feel a depressive episode. You'll feel lethargic. You'll feel withdrawn. Um, you'll feel sad. You will feel hopeless. And things that normally give you pleasure will not give you pleasure anymore. Um, as I told you guys, I'm a big gamer, right? When my dad died, uh, I have a awesome wife I come home and she's like Terry just 
play video games, chillax, do all the fun things you like to do. And she's real supportive, right? And I tried. I sat down on my keyboard, logged into my favorite video game, and just stared at the screen. Normally, that video game would give me a lot of pleasure, a lot of happiness to play. Not then. Not for a couple weeks. Now, the great thing about depressive episodes is they only last about two to three weeks. If that lasts a month, two months, six months, now we have a new diagnosis. It's called major depressive disorder. Not a depressive episode, but an actual disorder. So uh, you're all going to deal with that, and you're all going to need to use these therapy sessions. But just curious, what do you guys think? I hadn't seen anybody in chat. What do you think Linda's best option was? You think it was seeing the humanistic therapist, the psychodynamic therapist, or the cognitive behavioral therapist? I think all of you could probably guess as to which one Terry would pick, given my background and training. I'm not going to end the stream until somebody tells me something in the chat. <laughs> you, have to, you have to tell me something. I need to play like a Jeopardy song or something on my phone. <laughs> right, I, got a, I got at least one response here. Okay. JL says, hey, I like the I like the psychodynamic approach. Okay, cool. Yeah, I I think that uh, of the three, certainly I would agree with you that the humanistic approach is not probably the most effective approach for Linda. Uh, and two, you know, you got my money and time and resources, logistics. Like, can you get to therapy? Like right now, right with COVID-19, I have some friends that are humanistic therapists and they're having a lot of trouble because... Uh, their their clients don't work well with iPad delivery therapy. They need that close proximity, body language, lots of time. So it's causing trouble. Um, yeah, I mean, I I like both the cognitive behavioral and the psychodynamic approaches for Linda. I really love the assertiveness of the cognitive behavioral approach. Not gonna lie, uh, I like the logic uh, portion of it. But it, she seemed to deal with it pretty well. Like it didn't seem to cause her too much distress. Uh, but she seemed to react the best. I would agree. She seemed to react the best with the psychodynamic approach. All right. So uh, why is my table so blurry? Why is everything so blurry? <laughs> I don't know. The stream went completely blurry, guys. My apologies. I'm like, maybe my uh, stream is lagging or something here for a second. Uh, okay. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow. I'm going to try to squeeze in one more little therapy session uh, tomorrow before we review. So come back for that. I'm going to show you guys uh, uh, exposure therapy with snakes. So <laughs> it's really good. I hope, hope you'll come back and, and um, join me for that. But I'll bid you all farewell for today. See you guys tomorrow, 11 a.m., same time, same place. Until then, study hard, get all your stuff knocked out, get ready to finish the semester out strong. You guys have a good afternoon. We'll see you.